thank you all for attending virtually this evening. Uh, it's, it's a thrill to see friends both new and old and to have a, a bit of a repeat viewer crowd for After Hours, so welcome everyone. Um, I, I do want to say that it's really an honor to be joined on the virtual stage by Sachiko Kusukawa. Um, this program has been a little over a year in the making, and I'm thrilled to be able to share it with you all. Uh, and so over the next 40 minutes, what we'll uh, do, really Sachiko will do, is talk about four books from the Linda Hall Library's collection, uh, books by Robert Hooke, Grunfels, Fuchs, and Vesalius, uh, two of which you see here before me. Uh, and then that'll take about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, so this, I should note that this part of the program is pre-recorded because Sachiko is uh, six hours ahead of us. And so the we'll have a pre-recorded part, and then we'll have a live question and answer session at the end for the remainder of the program. Um, and with those little housekeeping notes, I'd like to hand it over to Sachiko. Thank you very much. Jason, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to come and join the um, After Hours series. As Jason mentioned, it's taken a long time for me to uh, find the time to do justice to the material that I wanted to talk about, and I'm delighted to be here finally today. I'm a historian of science of early modern Europe, with an interest in scientific illustrations and visualizations. That means I study how images functioned in form, informing and disseminating scientific knowledge. That means I study how images functioned in forming and disseminating scientific knowledge. Today, I've chosen four examples from the wonderful collection at the Linda Hall Library. It has to be said, it was an embarrassment of riches, so um, just choosing four was a hard task. But I hope these examples was, will illustrate the variety of styles used to depict objects of nature, and that it often took time and a complex process to produce such images, and that the images function to illustrate scientific objects, as well as persuade viewers of the importance of those objects. Now, one of the difficulties I find of a presentation using digital images is that it's difficult to convey the sense of the size or the three-dimensionality of the book. So I'm very grateful today uh, that Jason is going to show the books at the library to offer a sense of what the books actually look like. So let me start with this book, famous for being the first printed book with naturalistically drawn images of plants. It is also unusual in that it was a project led by an enterprising printer in Strasbourg called Johannes Schott. Schott was university educated and acquired the principles of scholarship that defined this period called the Renaissance, namely the idea that the ancient Greeks and the Romans possessed important knowledge that should be revived in order to improve knowledge of the present. And good Renaissance scholarship meant writing in good Latin, being able to read ancient Greek and being familiar with the classical authors. The title then, in uh, it, um, the title in Latin, but translated in English means lively images of herbs fashioned after nature with the greatest diligence and skill, together with their efficacies for the sake of that ancient and now revived herbal medicine. This confirms indeed that this is a Renaissance project. The rest of the frontispiece, probably designed by Hans Weiditz, an artist known to be in the circle of Albrecht Dürer, captures several elements of this Renaissance fashion, showing figures from classical mythology in a verdant setting and inscriptions provided in Latin or Greek. The two figures flanking the title here, here this is Apollo, Greek god of medicine, and over here Dioscorides, the first century author of the most important Greek work on medicinal plants. At the top is the figure of Venus, the goddess of fertility, 
and there is a story about Silenus, the god of drunkenness. And at the bottom here is illustrates one of the labors of Hercules, where Hercules here is slaying a dragon in order to obtain the golden apples of the gods. So this was a book that signaled visually that it was following the most recent intellectual fashion of classicism. The way the book was made was that Schott, who knew the artist Hans Weiditz, asked him to go around Strasbourg and draw plants as he encountered them. Schott then asked Brunfels to identify the plants from Greek authorities. Here you see a woodcut of a hazelwort done by Weiditz, and then Brunfels has given a list of names in Greek, Latin, as well as German, and then he's added comments from, found in Dioscorides about the plant and their medicinal efficacies. Now, what's interesting in particular about this image that I got from the Linda Hall Library um, digitized version is that it's very nice because not, instead of just digitizing the page here, it's digitized the full book. So you can actually see that this, this is a pretty thick book. It's over 500 pages. But more interestingly, it has a decoration. It's called Four Edge Decoration, where the title of the book Herbarum, as you can see, has been painted on. And this actually suggests that when the book was kept on the shelf, this edge was showing so that the user could find where the book on herbs was. In some cases, Brunfels was unable to identify the plants with cl the classical ones. For example, here with a Kuchenschel, the German name was known, but he couldn't find a comparable plant in the works of the classics. And in other cases, the names of the plant were known only in German or not at all. The, the locals didn't appear to know what the names of the plant were, nor their medical uses. So that means that these were plant pictures inserted in a book, but medically speaking, had very limited use. An important characteristic of Weiditz's style of drawing, apart from its vivid naturalistic techniques, is that they depict the plants as he saw them, including all their blemishes, such as bent stalks, leaves with holes in them, withered leaves, as well as these um, edges of leaves that have been battered, and so on they stressed the particular individual objects with all its imperfections. In the German edition, the images were referred to as counterfeit, which at the time meant portraits and effigies of individuals. So the counterfeit style in the period meant a warts and all depiction that stressed the particular individual objects, including its imperfections. After Brunfels's work, images fashioned after nature became an important aspect of 16th century illustrations, but they also very soon became modified. I now turn to the work by Leonhard Fuchs, professor of medicine at Tübingen, published 12 years after Brunfels's book and printed in a larger format. It was another Renaissance book in that it was a commentary on the medicinal plants of the Greek authority Dioscorides. The book contained a portrait of himself at the beginning and also the graphic artists who contributed to making the images of the book at the end of the book. Fuchs here is shown 
holding a plant. And this is a reference to the idea of autopsia, a Greek word for seeing for oneself. And this is an attitude that the Greek author Dioscorides advocated in the study of plants. The portrait of the artists here at the end of the book indicate the common division of labor at the time in creating woodcuts. At top right, Albrecht, Albrecht Meyer draws on paper a plant that he sees in front of him in a vase. This drawing is then transferred to a woodblock by Heinrich Fulmaurer, and then the woodblock, and then the woodblock is cut by the woodcutter here called sculptor Veit Rudolf Specklin. This happens to be the only example in the 16th century of a printed visual acknowledgement of the craftsman involved in producing illustrations for a printed book. It clearly reflects Fuchs's pride in the work that they had produced. And what they have produced was quite a bit different from Weidutz's images. So here I'd want to comp here I'd like to compare Brunfels and Fuchs by showing you woodcuts of the same plant, the left one by Brunfels and the, the, the right one by Fuchs. Now I've shown these images as if they are comparable sizes, but just to let you know that Fuchs's book is about 30% taller than Brunfels's book. As I said, it is the woodcut of the same plant, but here in Fuchs's image, you actually see that there are some smaller budding flowers coming out. And in addition to the mature flower, here you actually see the flower which now carries the seeds. And also there is minimal shading in this woodcut and the outline of the leaves have been tidied up to be clean and continuous. In the preface of his book, Fuchs stated that he had asked his artists to include minimal shading and the images should be as perfect as possible. And that meant including all aspects of a plant, including the root, the leaves, the buds, the flowers, and the fruits. The shadow shadowless images with clean outlines were also conducive to being colored. And in fact, the colored version possibly shows you a bit better what these images were about. To the left, you see different stages of the cherry tree with buds, flowers, and fruits merged all into one bush. To your right, you see three variations of the dead nettle with flowers in yellow, pink, and white. So Fuchs's images show plants across time and variations all in one bush. Scholars have called these images idealized images. It is a form of pictorial generalization. And this was important for Fuchs, as he wanted to ensure that the medicinal efficacy of plants applied not only to individual plants at a particular time or place, but to all samples of the given plant. The object of scientific knowledge had to be general, and that is what he tried to represent in his pages, even if they did not exist as such in nature. Fuchs too included plants not known to the ancients, and these are from the New World. What he then did was to infer their medicinal properties from their taste or their features and find comparable plants from the ancient world. So in the case of the chili pepper, he inferred that they were actually like European pepper. And 
the pumpkin from the New World, he considered to have similar characteristics to gourds and melons known to the ancients. So he found ways to integrate plants unknown to the ancients into a classical scheme of knowledge. The original drawings by Fuchs's artists have survived and they turn out to be finished images. The artists have already been instructed to create ideal images. They don't show bent stems, torn leaves or anything like that. Here, two variations of the valerian have been merged into one bush. And here, in the case of the pomegranate, you see the flower and the fruit then drawn together. You also see around these drawings annotations by Fuchs himself, where he had added further corrections. So these finished drawings must have been carefully compiled over time with close supervision and intervention from the author Fuchs. So in other words, this portrait of first-hand observation, tracing and cutting as shown here is a bit misleading as it suggests a seamless transition from first-hand observation of a plant in a vase to a woodcut. But none of the plants were shown in a vase and as we have just seen, they were carefully prepared over time, adjusted and modified so that they could represent objects of scientific knowledge, namely generalized universal objects that encompassed all aspects of a plant without blemishes. In the absence of professional scientific illustrators, scientific authors in this period relied on artists this was also the case with perhaps the most famous anatomical work of the 16th century, published a year after Fuchs's book, Andres Vesalius's Fabric of the Human Body, using larger paper than Fuchs's book. It is famous for its title page, emphasizing first-hand di first dissection, again a Renaissance idea in that the classical author Galen advocated that first-hand dissection of the human bodies was necessary to understand anatomical knowledge. Many of Fabrica's illustrations were designed by Jan Stefan van Kalker, active in Venice, probably in the circle of Titian, and several artistic traits can be found in the illustrations. For example, the seminal veins and arteries were embedded in a torso from the Belvedere Gardens in the Vatican, famous at the time and, and very famous at the time and believed to represent the body of Hercules. Vesalius wished to discuss in his book a body that was as, per as perfect as possible without any individual idiosyncrasies and abnormalities, which he said had been eliminated from his descriptions. Alluding to the idea of a classical sculpture that was considered the most perfect and called the canon, he too said that his study of the human body was about studying the canon of the human body. So embedding a dissected body into a classical sculpture was not just an artistic move, but was intended to make it the ideal human body and dignify the subject of human anatomy. The book is also famous for a series of full-size posed myological figures set against back backgrounds of landscapes and buildings, as you can see here. Anatomical details were carefully embedded in parts of the body so that each figure showed an increasing level of dissectedness. These figures take the pose of contraposto or variation of contraposto. As asked historians would know, 
this was a pose that was regarded as the most graceful gesture of the period. The fact that the figures of the dissected muscles take the same pose throughout the book suggests to the reader that they were looking at the same body. Vesalius urged his readers to look at the images before and after each one to understand what was above and underneath each structure. The contraposter pose also gave the body a slight twist, which allowed him to show a bit more structure than in a straight-on frontal image. The importance of a slight tilt can be appreciated with a comparison between an image of the underside of the skull. This left-hand view from 1538 is dead on straight and emphasizes the symmetry of the skull. Vesalius images to your right here is slightly tilted and that allows for a bit more of the structure here to be shown than this particular form of representation. So the choice of how an object is posed was also related to optimizing information that could be conveyed in one go. I've already mentioned the background landscapes that appear to be pretty settings for the muscle figures. But it's been long known that they form a sequence of the dissected body in stages. As I've just shown you here, it, this is a digitally stitched um, image, obviously, of all the muscle figures from Fabrica. This is important because this was Vesalius' idea, Vesalius' idea that the ideal three-dimensional human body should be un understood sequentially through these dissected images. While Vesalius was helped by artists such as Jan Stephen van Kalke, he also hoped that he could help artists. He said that these two figures were specifically meant to instruct artists and sculptors who needed to know how the muscles stretched and contracted in movement. The importance of anatomical knowledge for artists had been stressed since the 15th century by artists such as Leon Battista Alberti or even Leonardo da Vinci. But the study of anatomy had not become regularized as part of an artist's training until the establishment of the Academy of Art and Design in Florence, 20 years after the publication of the Fabrica, that is in 1563. Now, the copy at Linda Hall is very interesting, I think, in this regard. It has um, at the bottom of the title page here, which I have enlarged, an inscription which reads essentially the book is or belongs to Jacopo Marchesetti of Florence and in Greek, Chiton Philon, that means and his friends. So it seems that this is a book that Mar 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 uh, Marchesetti felt belonged not just to himself, but he could share with his friends. Marchesetti became physician at the Academy of Art and Design in Florence. Now, we don't know much about him and what he was doing there, but it feels as if we should do more research or more research is needed in terms of how his knowledge of anatomy garnered perhaps through this book may have helped budding artists at the Academy some of whom may well been have uh, may have been his friends. So far, my examples have been of scientific investigators from the 16th century and who also relied on graphic artists. My final example is from the 17th century by Robert Hooke, a fellow of the Royal Society who made the drawings for the book about microscopic observation dedicated to, dedicated to Charles II. 
Hooke had been apprenticed to one of the most famous portrait painters of his time, Peter Lilly, but left because he found that the smell of oil painting gave him headaches. But he was the one who made the drawings for micrographia and the engravings were done by other artists. But Hooke said that they were fairly faithful in reproducing the original drawings. In the preface to his book, Hooke explained the time-consuming and complex task of observation by a microscope and how to make images from them. In particular, he said that he had to make repeated observations of an object in different positions of light in order to determine its true shape. He said that it was difficult to distinguish whether an object was round or sunken or whether the black and white spots that he was seeing on the surface of the objects were truly on the surface or were in fact shadows or reflections caused by light. And determining shape was something Hook really needed to be careful in establishing and he showed here in the case of the eye of the fly, or more accurately, the receptors of the fly, how he went about doing this. In the engraving of the receptors here, you, which has been enlarged here, you will see that each of these receptors have been given a small curves, have been engraved with small curves on the edges to make them look like three-dimensional spheres. And in a separate image, he explained that, uh, in a separate image, he illustrated how he determined them. Hooke said that he established the domed shape of the receptor of the eye of the fly by means of reflections of trees outside his window, as well as his hands or fingers. But ultimately, the double windows in his room allowed him to work out that the receptor had a domed rather than a sunken shape. This is quite remarkable. This image is really quite remarkable, remarkable because this is the only time Hooke showed an intermediate state of his observation. This is the kind of visual work he needed to do to establish the actual shape of things that he was seeing. Now, using a reflection of windows was a well-known technique in Dutch still life painting of the period. Peter Lilly collected many Dutch still life works, which were also becoming very fashionable among English collectors. A reflection of window on an eye often called the window of the soul, was also a convention dating all the way back to the 16th century with Albrecht Dürer. In micrographia, objects were often placed within a circle simulating an observer's viewpoint. The circular image was an effective way to persuade the readers that this was what one sees by glancing through a microscope. However, because the focal length of microscopes at the time was limited, Hooke would have needed to adjust his microscope's focus several times to see the entire three-dimensional globular structures like this. It took several views after adjusting the microscope before Hooke could finally draw. There was also still a tendency towards generalization the leaf of the seaweed at the top here represented small gaps within its structure that Hooke believed was potentially unique and common to plants that were submerged underwater, and he hoped that others would confirm this. Here, in the case of the underside of the leaf of the rosemary, he said that 
there was nothing particularly interesting about the rosemary, except for the fact that Hook had noticed that plants with other plants with smooth leaves had this kind of similar structure. So again, he is indicating that this is not just about a rosemary, but all plants with leaves that have smooth surfaces. And finally here to the, the right at the bottom um, is the structure of a fine linen cloth, which he shows as being very coarse. And this was to make a general point that Hook repeated throughout his book, that at the microscopic level, nature's patterns are more regular, intricate, perfect and beautiful than the best products of the human hand. Another point of generalization. Before I end, I'd like to draw attention to the scale bar here at the top, which explains the level of magnification. This is one of the implications of microscopic observations, that scale needed to be defined. Hooke often used a scale bar, but he often tried to illustrate scale physically. So here is a fish scale shown as an actual size next to the magnified object. The actual fish scale uh, image is about seven millimeters. So there are two ways of indicating scale, either using a scale bar or showing it physically in terms of what the naked eye can see and what the microscopic image looks like. Hook's book was intended to impress the king and his other readers of the beauty of the micro world. Some of the illustrations are very large. And as a contemporary scientific figure, Christian Haugens explained, there was a flea the size of a cat. These prints had to be folded in and inserted into the book, which means that most surviving copies have some tear marks as there will be here and here. Readers would first have encountered some of the illustrations as folded paper in the book, which they had to gradually unfold and encounter, for example, a louse almost half a meter long. Because engravings were inserted after the text of the book was printed, the large prints could be inserted in different ways. Here, the large louse is inserted vertically, but I believe the Linda Hall copy um, has the louse being inserted horizontally. The images in Micrographia were not so much a snapshot from a brief glance into a microscope, but a result of time-consuming, complex and repeated observation to establish the true shape of objects, which would shed light on more general points about nature. The clever use of the encircled images, as well as oversized insects, were ways to persuade and impress the viewers of the pattern of nature below the threshold of eyesight. So I hope that with these four examples, I've shown that great care, effort and thought had gone into creating images in scientific books in pre-modern Europe so that they could help create a general or dignified or beautiful object from nature. And I hope you'll have the chance to turn the pages and unfold the images of the actual books to appreciate the full extent of these efforts. Thank you very much. Well, 
I want to take the chance to thank Sachiko again. Uh, frankly, uh, she's a hard act to follow, <laughs> uh, but we're thrilled uh, that you all are here this evening. We are live now in the Cherry Street studio, and I am thankful to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Ben Gross. Hi, everybody. Vice President for Research and Scholarship here. Um, so let me just open another, uh, issue another invitation to uh, put some questions in the Q&A uh, chat box that you see down there underneath. Um, ben and I will do our best um, to, to answer those questions. Uh, but I, I, as I said, Sachiko's a hard act to follow, being one of the leading experts in this topic in the field. Um, and so we'll do our very best. And if we can't answer a question, we're going to want to know the answer to it. And so we'll be glad to pass those along to Sachiko. So while you all think about what excellent questions that Ben and I can answer for you <laughs> this evening about the four books that are behind us, Hook, Brunfels, Fuchs, and Vesalius, um, one of the things that we wanted to kind of uh, touch on was that three of the books, Brunfels, Fuchs, and Vesalius, uh, use a single form of image reproduction that you see pretty commonly in prints, which is they used woodcuts. Uh, but Hook was different, right? Right. Hook used copper plate engravings, mm -hmm. or I guess technically etchings, yeah. in order to have more detailed illustrations to really show the, the um, amount of, of fine uh, visual, well, detail, frankly, exactly right. that he was able to see under that microscope. Yeah. yeah, and Ben, you've hit on one of the, the great advantages of using, using copper plates or really metal engravings uh, as a... Uh, a surface for book illustration, which is that you have a high level of resolution that you can include in those images. So that's one of the advantages. One of the disadvantages is that you can't run it through the printing press at the same time as the type. That's one of the great, great advantages of woodcuts because you can cut the woodcuts to be type high, so you only have to have one impression. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to kind of point out the different uh, book illustration methods that are represented behind us in these closed books and that Sachiko talked about uh, as well. And uh, you know, we have our first question uh, from Adriana, which is, uh, what was Hook's profession? Hook did an awful lot of things. And I'm going to name a few of the things that I know about off the top of my head. And I know that Ben's going to have more, uh, more to add to this. Uh, Hook was a sometime architect and engineer. Uh, he was also a, he would consider himself a natural philosopher. He was also keeper of experiments at the Royal Society. Uh, that's uh, it, it, in that role, he uh, got the, Royal Society's Imprimatur to publish uh, one of the Royal Society's early books, Micrographia. Um, and I know I've missed some, Ben. I think you've covered most of them. I was, I was waiting for you to talk about the Keeper of Experiments. Yep. Like that's, that's a very big role. He was mm -hmm. essentially in charge of, of maintaining their experimental apparatus and, mm -hmm. and performing demonstrations of things like the air pump or the microscope or what have you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the architecture mm -hmm. work that he did is also rather important, particularly right. in the wake of the Great Fire of London. Yes. Uh, so those, he was involved in a, in a bunch of different projects. He was really a polymath. Well, and speaking of the Great Fire, uh, unrelated, uh, one of the things that I think about is that we were reviewing some of the scholarship around micrographia, and there's some speculation that Christopher Wren was responsible for some of those uh, illustrations, the original drawings, I think. Mm. Okay, great. Well, th so that nice connection to the Great Fire of, of London. Um, so we got uh, another question from Florence there, one which we can speculate on, but Florence, as you correctly point out, uh, uh, Sachiko would be the expert on the, the landscape in the background of all of the woodcuts in uh, the Vesalius, which is this book here. Um, so it is a known landscape, but where it is has escaped my brain. I, I have told people that it's Florence before, but I don't know if that's correct. I'm reasonably certain it's somewhere in the Tuscan countryside. Perfect. But I don't remember exactly where. Yeah. Um, and it does make a continuous or quasi-continuous panorama yep. to demonstrate um, as you're moving through into the various parts of the body, as you're moving inside, it's as though you're moving geographically as well down a line, yep. you know, down, down this pathway. Yep. Uh, across the countryside. Great. Well, and, and uh, Heather Hoffman has asked uh, in the chat, one of my favorite questions that uh, when you come to the library and you see the Vesalius, we often talk about, which is how were books of human anatomy received by the church at the time? So if you looked at the, if you were able to look at the catalog records for the books, you see that the Vesalius was printed in Basel in, uh, in the Confederacy of Switzerland. Now we would just call that Switzerland. Uh, printed there because the printing of that anatomical knowledge would have um, gone against kind of standard theology and moralities of the Catholic Church at the time. Um, but can you talk about, Ben, a little bit about how those uh, 
source material, I think I would put it generously, was, was sourced uh, for Vesalius to do those woodcuts. So it's a complicated question because although Italy was, of course, very much a, a Catholic country, yep. many of the, the major anatomical theaters at the time were in Padua, Pisa, mm -hmm. Italian cities with universities in the Bologna, yep. right? Uh, the problem wasn't so much the fact they were teaching anatomy. It was where do you get the, the subjects of your dissections? Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't easy to find uh, cadavers at the time. Right. Uh, and so you were often forced to rely on uh, you know, the, the bodies of hanged or, or otherwise executed convicts. Uh, and of course, you had to conduct the dissections very quickly because there was no refrigeration at the time. Anatomy was a messy, smelly business with you know, it, it was not glamorous, but if you wanted to get an inside look and really uh, understand the inner structure of the body, that was the only way to do it. You could also, of course, and uh, there are images on the on the frontispiece of the Vesalius that hint at this, you could also uh, perform dissections of animals, right? Monkeys, dogs, that kind of thing. And that, that was unfortunately rather common. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. It looks like we have a couple of other questions in the chat here. One is we have a question about the uh, engravers of Hooke's Micrographia. Hooke's Micrographia, which I'm actually, as you can see, I've got my notes in front of me, Bruno, uh, and I am turning to that. So I don't have any specific information about who, what individuals would have been responsible for the engravings of Hooke, Hooke's Micrographia. Um, but I will say that it is printed uh, by the printers to the Royal Society, uh, Martin and Alistair. Um, and so there would have been, I've read a couple of places, and I don't know if I'm correct in saying this, that Hook learned to engrave to create these himself. I've read something to that effect, <laughs> but I don't remember where. That's right. So Bruno, that's something that uh, if you want to email us, uh, we would be uh, happy to kind of dig into that a little more, because I think we're both legitimately curious about who was responsible for those things. It is worth noting again, however, as, as Sachiko mentioned in her talk, that Hook, even if he didn't do the engravings, he still did the drawings yes. upon which they were based, which Absolutely. is which is a big piece of that. Um, and I, I did see uh, somebody uh, put in a question about how can we view these books in person? Well, one of the extraordinary things, uh, and I, I've got to give thanks to Sachiko for saying that we were a little bit of an embarrassment of riches to look at. I would agree. It is a a thrilling experience to work with this collection and with great colleagues like Ben regularly. Um, if you want to use these books in person, uh, and these are all uh, kept in our rare book vault, we took them out especially for you all this evening. Um, <clears throat> if you wanted to use them, our request is you've got to have a research purpose. So you could be a high school student, um, you can be a postdoctoral scholar, you can be a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Uh, who you are doesn't matter as long as you've got a research purpose to use the materials. That could be you're working on an art project, um, and it could be that you're working on uh, Euclidean mathematics. Um, whatever your purpose is, as long as you've got one, uh, you contact uh, the library, the reference desk, and we'll set you up with an appointment to come in and use the books and see all the wonderful things that Sachiko talked about and Ben and I are kind of chatting about um, loosely now. Now, if you don't have a research purpose, one thing we should emphasize is that the books have all been digitized and are freely available for you to read, download. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all, you know, in the public domain. You could uh, take the images and, and make them into wallpaper for your phone or your, or your computer or whatever. Uh, they're all there, freely available. One of the things we, we have really done a great job with is, is making sure that our rare books are accessible uh, through our online collections. And I believe that links to all of the relevant books today, uh, at least three of them I can see in the in the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the hook has been posted yet, but they're all there. Yep. Yeah, the hook and the hook is kind of a little bit, I wouldn't say it's an exception. Maybe it's exceptional in this case because there are uh, fully, because it's it's uploaded in, in full resolution. And so there are single page images that you can use, which you saw Sachiko do in her presentation. Uh, and it's also, uh, for those of you all that are conversant with triple IF in the crowd, they're triple IF compliant as well. Um, well, uh, Finch Collins is asking a question. Were cadavers of criminals understood to be representative of all humans? I, I have no I I idea. Uh, I'm going to hope that Ben's got a little something on that. I think there's actually a bigger philosophical question here, which is to say, how much can any individual yeah. cadaver be used to represent the entirety of humanity? Yeah. Yeah. I think that in all likelihood, Vesalius would argue for the need for empirical observation, right? Mm -hmm. You get as many different cadavers as you can. You try to find uh, commonalities between them, mm -hmm. and then you try to take your your uh, best shot to generalize and and make a claim about the the broader 
kind of, I don't know, idealized human. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I also, Finch, appreciate that you pointed out that Hook did invent a di diving apparatus and was an astronomer. Uh, regular viewers of After Hours will know that there was some tension in the Royal Society about Hook's position within it and his station as what we would today call a scientist and an active fellow or not. Uh, we don't have time to unpack that tonight, I think. We could do an entire uh, an entire After Hours just on Hook and That's his exactly career. Right. That's um, exactly right. and, and maybe we will one day. Yeah. Um, so Karen, uh, down at the bottom of our Q&A chat, uh, ans asked the question, are any of these Linda Hall copies annotated? If so, by whom? Well, uh, you're in luck, Karen, uh, because they are. As Sachiko pointed out, uh, our Vesalius does have that ownership inscription uh, underneath the wood engraved title page. Uh, and then it has some additional manuscript notes in the margins and corrections to Vesalius's text as well. Um, I'm looking through my notes on each copy of the book. You can also look at the catalog records uh, from the comfort of your own home if you're curious. Uh, our hook does not have any manuscript annotations in it. Um, I don't think the Fuchs does either. Nope. And Brunfels? Brunfels does not, it appears. So there you go. I'm glad I printed these out. Thanks for the question, Karen. Uh, yeah, happy memories of visits to Linda Hall decades ago. Well, uh, we were glad to have you and we're glad to still be here and we're glad you're here this evening. Um, it looks like we have another question from Guy Seacrest. Yes. Guy, hello. Uh, Guy asks, should we also see these works as an enterprise, especially in Vesalius and Hook's work in making such work with gross objects more technical? That is, as Ben has stated, the work with human bodies and mundane insects is not typically thought of as being something worthy of a profession for the time. Is it possible these technical aspects of depicting them lends more legitimacy to these interests? I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the short version is particularly when you're talking about Hook, one of his great um, kind of arguments throughout this book, and again, Sachiko yeah. pointed this out, is that there is great beauty in the seemingly mundane. Right. If you look at the sophistication of the drawing of the flea or the louse that we saw earlier and then compare it to sort of the rough uh, appearance of the the human made objects that Hook looks at. Uh, one of the first things he looks at in the book, for example, is like the point of a needle mm -hmm. and it looks remarkably jagged and rough. And you wouldn't think that normally, right? Based on our everyday experience, that's mm -hmm. not what you see. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you compare that to the the glories of of these uh, microscopic organisms that he's looking at, right? The 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 essential plates of armor that you see on the flea, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that is a subject he would argue is worthy of study. Mm -hmm. uh, anatomy is a somewhat more complicated subject because there was a general kind of understanding that yes, one needed to understand the human body if if humans were indeed the uh, epitome of divine creation yeah. if they were if if humans if mankind was really the center of the cosmos you had to understand that so i don't know if it was necessarily uh viewed in the same way uh, although one could argue that there is a distinction between physician and surgeon which plays into this a little bit yeah. and i'm not sure how much vesalius gets at, into that in the book I, I will uh, loop back for just a moment and take the opportunity to uh, to encourage you all to read the text of Hook's book, if you, Hook's book, Micrographia. Um, if you look at it online or you have the opportunity to see a copy near your, you or here at the Linda Hall Library, some of the ways in which he got his, uh, the images that you see in the book are, are entertaining. Uh, the, the ant especially. Uh, You're going to tell them how he got the ant? He got the ants drunk on brandy. Uh, everyone. He didn't want to kill the ant because right. the goal was to capture its microscopic visage from life. But how are you going to get an ant to stay still under a microscope for long enough? Well, it turns out you get them drunk mm -hmm. and just a few drops of brandy and that ant won't move anywhere. Mm -hmm. At least it'll stay still long enough for you to make a sketch. Let's see. It looks like we have a couple more questions. Do you want to take here. David's question? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, so David Delara asks, didn't Vesalius contend that Galen was incorrect in many details because he, Galen, didn't dissect human bodies, but rather apes, etc.? And yes, that was one of Vesalius's critiques is essentially uh, Galen didn't do his homework. Galen could have, have been more thorough. And if you rely purely on animal dissections uh, and don't do the kind of systematic human dissections that Vesalius was was really encouraging, uh, you won't have a thorough understanding of the human body. 
So yes, uh, Vesalius took issue with the way that Galenic medicine was going on. He also was arguing against just um, unquestioned acceptance of classical authorities. This was something that a lot of these authors, in fact, you could argue all of them in various ways were pushing, is you can't just take what ancient authors, for example, if you were talking about plants, you can't just take what Dioscorides says um, verbatim, right? If for no other reason, there are all these new plants coming in from the new world and the ancients didn't know about those. So you have to figure out a way to fit them into your taxonomy. Uh, I will say the, there's a question here from Breno about how many copies of Hooke's Micrographia were produced and how many avail are available today. So in pre preparing for this presentation this evening, uh, Ben and I looked at kind of the authoritative Hooke bibliography, which is uh, Keynes. And Keynes just surveys a few places. So based on the sources that I looked at today, there's not an authoritative census of micrographia copies, but I know one of our former research fellows is working on a project related to kind of the publications of Robert Hooke and his life, Yelda. Yeah, Yelda Nasafaglu, one of our former research fellows has been working on, on Hooke's, uh, a project called Hooke's Books. Mm -hmm. It's essentially his library. Yeah. But she's also been looking into Hooke's career as an architect, for mm -hmm. example, really getting into those papers. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the Hooke's Books project has a, a web presence, yes, right? Uh, so if you Google Hooke's Books, you can learn a lot more about uh, the stuff that Hooke was himself reading and maybe gain some insight into uh, his publication history as yeah. well. And then uh, how many copies of it were produced? I don't know that off the top of my head. And having written an article last year about the production of Principia, um, I would normally just breezily say you should consult the Royal Society, but production of books uh, and knowledge and printed knowledge of the Royal Society is a much more complicated topic than I think we understand, I understand as a bibliography that looks at early modern books. Um, my first port of call, Breno, would be to uh, contact the Royal Society uh, and to see if they have some resources that will tell you uh, in their uh, record books uh, and in the materials that they have, if there's a recorded number of copies that were printed. Um, books at this time, a, a very big ballpark guess, the book is printed in folio, which is as a bibliographic format. You'd expect about 500 copies, but that's not always true in every single case. Uh, we have another question from David here about the second edition of Hook, the one with just the plates. Uh, we do, in fact, have a copy of Micrographia Restaurata, which was published in the 18th century and features the same plates uh, and a kind of summary of Hook's text. It's uh, not exactly a second edition. It's the plates survived after Hook passed away. Uh, and there was kind of a, enough of a demand to publish a, a reprint of just the images with kind of a, an overview, a synopsis of what Hook was writing, because people didn't want to go through as much of the text. Mm -hmm. Or I guess that was the, the argument at the time. And then uh, Rob Harton, thank you for waiting a while for us to get to your question. We had a lot of great questions this evening, and yours is certainly among them. Uh, this is kind of a more technical library side question, mm -hmm. which is how much effort is made to correct the distortion of your digitized images. Um, the first thing that I should say is we have a extraordinary uh, digitization department here at the library. Uh, we have a wealth of digitized materials available free online, and we continue to, to, to add to that the, the number of those materials. Um, one of the things that and I don't necessarily want to speak for my colleagues, but based upon my interactions, I can approximate an answer that they might make. Um, one of the things that we think about when we digitize materials, well, two of them really is, is it readable? Um, so we wanna make sure that it's not so distorted that you can't read the text on the page or the images on the page don't make sense. But the second thing is that we're trying to make a surrogate for the physical object. Um, so that you both have a sense of the the book as an information container, right? So the stuff that's inside of it, the readability of it, but also the book as a physical artifact, as much as you can do that in a digital realm. And one of the ways that we do that is with extensive catalog description so that you can, as someone engaged with early modern books or perhaps in bibliography, you can build a mental model of the books that we have available that are both digitized and fully described in the catalog. So we have, uh, I think we'll just kind of, we'll maybe pick one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard Schwartz has asked about the second issue of Micrographia. 
which I do not believe that uh, we have a copy of the second issue of Micrographia because it would be shelved right next to the first issue of Micrographia. Mm -hmm. um, if you all are, are wondering about issues of Micrographia, I would uh, uh, encourage you to visit the Keynes bibliography of Robert Hooke. Uh, that'll explain the difference. There's some differences in the title page. Um, and I, I, Tom Tansel might take issue with the uh, <laughs> take issue with his conception of issue with his <laughs> conception of issue, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so we yeah. have another question in the chat from Heather, right. who asks, "Do these particular copies carry with them any history of ownership? Yes. How have they managed to survive? How are they with you now?" <laughs> so maybe we could ask, you know, more broadly, just how did each yeah. of these books arrive in the collection? That's exactly right. So. Micrographia came to us from our acquisition of the Library of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1946. Uh, and if you're curious, uh, Jamie, my former colleague, and I did a, an episode of our show Paper Cuts about our acquisition of the Library of the AAAS. Uh, our, if you go to our digitized copy, you'll see their blind stamp on the title page, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and so that came with our acquisition. The other three books we actually all purchased, let me confirm for you, Heather, from, no, two of the books we, we purchased from Jake Zeitlin, that Vesalius, frankly, is a little bit out of scope for us because we don't collect medicine. Anatomy is in a bit of a gray area, but our copy of Vesalius was a gift from Kansas City philanthropist, uh, Kenneth and Helen Spencer. And so they gave us our copy, which was an incredibly generous gift and an, still is an incredibly generous gift now. Um, so those are the ways that those books came to the library. As far as ownership, uh, Heather, there's a couple of things that I would point out. Our Vesalius, as Sachiko pointed out, was owned by the physician of the Academy of Design in Florence. Um, and the other thing, if I hope you're a bit of a book historian bibliographer, Heather, the other thing that I would uh, encourage you to do is in our Brunfels, in the catalog record for our Brunfels, I note uh, the roll stamps that are used. And so that may help you track some of the early history of that volume. I have not delved into it yet. Uh, but needless to say, these books have lived, you know, three, four, five hundred year lives, well, 400 year lives. Uh, and they're here now and they're not going anywhere. We're happy to have them here. Um, managed to survive. These books, uh, Heather asks, how have they managed to survive? These books were not inexpensive when they were produced. Um, and I, I think that Marchesetti's uh, comment about For His Friends kind of talks about, I spent a bunch of money on this book. I want to make it available to people that maybe don't have the money to buy a book in folio, a sumptuous book in folio. Um, and so um, that's one of the reasons why they've managed to survive, because there's a kind of a a rule of thumb that Owen Gingrich, a book historian and historian of the uh, astronomy at Harvard notes, which is that book, big books uh, live longer than small books. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you don't want to get rid of a big book. It's impressive. It was also very expensive when it was produced. Um, yeah, so I think uh, short of any other questions, which I don't really uh, see any other out there, um, I just want to thank Ben again for joining us. Um, I want to thank Sachiko. That was a delight. I look forward to viewing this again at home and kind of looking at it paired with our books. I want to thank all of you all for coming here this evening. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you very much for being here and uh, good evening. Yeah, thanks for joining us after hours. I guess we'll be back for another uh, edition of this soon. That's right. After hours with Mariah Mitchell. All right. Well, stay tuned for that, ladies and gentlemen. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.